question, and I'm going to talk now about maybe what we, you all we, you all have been waiting for: binding free energies. So um, you may be familiarized with this uh, this kind of setting, this kind of uh, 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 contraption which is oftentimes referred to as high-throughput virtual screening. So the idea is the following. The idea is uh, you, have a, uh, you have a certain target protein, so again, I'm putting the uh, neuraminidase, and you're trying to find a drug candidate for this particular uh, target. And so you have a library of drugs, either virtual or real, and pharmaceutical companies have huge libraries. And, and they're using these filters. These filters are nothing else than methods uh, of increasing sophistication. So you start with shape recognition, which is extremely fast, to discard a lot of you know, uh, poor candidates. And then you go to rigid docking, and then you go to flexible docking, and finally, you go to the most expensive calculation, which are the fringe calculations. But the idea is that every step of the way, the computational investment is constant. So you're doing a lot of cheap calculations or a few very expensive calculations. But in the end, you want to use fringe calculations for the best possible candidates to establish some kind of a ranking uh, 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 as a function of their affinity for the, uh, for, the, for, the uh, for the for the target. So what I put here on the right hand side are some excerpts of articles that uh, that were published in, uh, in 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 2000 and, and more recently 2013. Uh, all the way to 2000, pretty much free energy calculations were seen as kind of a promising way to uh, basically replace wet lab. So uh, uh, you would basically be able, with free energy calculations, or it, has, it was kind of oversold, let's face it. Uh, you would be able to predict uh, uh, binding affinities uh, with just with uh, number crunching. And then came the realization that it was not that simple. And it was not that simple for two reasons. Uh, first, uh, well, there was the competition investment. I mean, sampling for a long time was an issue, and uh, and uh, especially uh, when in the course of binding you have a lot of conformational uh, changes, uh, reorganization of the of the host, reorganization of the guest, and that is not always easily captured by by uh, by molecular dynamics. The other reason is, of course, the force field. So you already heard about force field, or maybe you will hear about force field. This is still a problem, actually. Uh, you know, having a good force field uh, for proteins, but also a good force field for small molecules. And let's face it, I mean, the force fields that we're using are very primitive. I mean, in, uh, the, the, if you're thinking in terms of uh, the, the, the macromolecular force field that we're using, which basically rely on the pairwise additive approximation, so that are bereft of uh, induction effects, and, uh, and they're very simple in terms of electrostatics. Uh, they're just using charges, so it's kind of a problem when you have atoms that have like lone pairs, and uh, so have like a big quadrupole, big atomic quadrupole. So describing a quadrupole with one charge is kind of uh, dangerous, uh, to say the least. Uh, and, and then polarization effects sometimes can be very important. So, um, so it's true that this, uh, the, the, this force fields are very rudimentary and, and kind of flag the, uh, the, uh, the accuracy of the fringe calculation. So today, even though uh, number crunching is less uh, of a problem I mean, uh, for different reasons, first because we have access to uh, more powerful, massively uh, parallel architectures, uh, um, there are still some issues. I mean, there are and, uh, so algorithms have uh, also kind of improved. So you have like variants of uh, of FEP calculation. You may have heard of REST. Uh, replica exchange really helped, like for uh, improving the ergodicity of the sampling. 
we're going to talk about that in the end uh, of, of the lecture. But but force field is definitely definitely a problem. That said, uh, it's important to establish uh, gold standards for this calculation, uh, and and these gold standards can be uh, established uh, using. Uh, uh, I would say a paragon for uh, protein ligand binding, and uh, and basically the example that I'm going to show you, uh, uh, we um, we're going to basically sweep under the rug the problem of the of the force field. So we're going to ignore. We're going to assume that the force field comes from God, and in this case, God is <laughs> Martin Kaplan and the John. <laughs> so you you could. You could think of the uh, of the protein ligand problem from a brute force MD uh, point of view. And this is a movie from a simulation that was done by Gianni de Fabritis in, uh, in Barcelona. So they basically run uh, many, many, many simulations, uh, uh, independent simulations, looking at uh, uh, binding events and unbinding events. I think that they didn't they didn't see any unbinding event. Maybe I'm wrong, but. Uh, that, that, that needs to be checked. But potentially, uh, uh, assuming that your binder is not too strong, I mean, you, you should be able to see if you run long enough. And uh, I think in that case, they were running 500 independent simulation of 100 nanoseconds each. Uh, so if you have enough statistics, you, you should be able to get enough uh, uh, off events, so unbinding events, and on events, binding events, so that you can get uh, you can approximate the, uh, the, uh, the, the dissociation constant that you need, which is readily uh, uh, comparable to experiments. So, from Biacore uh, surface uh, plasma resonance experiment or ITC isothermal uh, uh, calorimetry, which gives you the uh, which gives you the K. Basically, what we we are after is is this equilibrium: so protein plus ligand. Uh, uh, in equilibrium with the ligand bound to the to the protein. So what I'm going to show you now is maybe a, a, a different way to uh, to approach the problem. So not brute force MD, but using free energy uh, calculations in the context of alchemical free energy transformation. So what's the problem? What are we talking about here? So we have uh, we have uh, a box of water with a protein. And we have n ligands that are floating in the, in the, uh, around the protein, and one of the ligands is actually bound to the protein. So we're going to introduce two uh, two probabilities, p zero, uh, that uh, that the the, 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 the the ligand is not bound to the protein, and p one that the protein uh, that the ligand is bound to the protein. So we can we can rearrange the uh, uh, rewrite the equilibrium constant introducing this uh, p1 and p0 uh, probability and then we're going to expand them uh, uh, introducing some configurational intervals so i'm going to i'm going to introduce uh, two uh, subscripts uh, i'm going to introduce the subscript site and the subscript bulk so if i say site it means that the ligand is bound to the protein and if I say bulk, if I write bulk, it means that the ligand is floating in the bulk far enough from the protein. So as you can see here, we have a combinatorial. So if the, the, the first ligand is bound to the protein, then here, the second term, the, the second ligand is bound to the protein, and so on and so forth. But of course, the ligands are indiscernible, right? So we can kind of factorize and put like an N uh, in front of uh, of the of the integral because we have n ligands, and we will now also uh, write that uh, the, the 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 concentration in ligand is equal because it's a kind of a homogeneous uh, uh, environment. That uh, the the concentration in ligand is equal to n divided by the volume of the bulk. I'm going to also introduce this uh, this Dirac function, saying that if my ligand is uh, not bound to the protein. I, I assume that it's lying far away at some position x1 star, uh, so that it does not interact with the, it doesn't see the protein. And so in the end, I'm getting this uh, equilibrium constant, uh, which, uh, which, which includes this, uh, this Dirac function. As such, I can't do much with it. Uh, certainly from the point of view of, of molecular dynamics, I cannot do much with it. And I'm going to show you now that we're going to 
we can we can take these two uh, two different routes, the alchemical routes and the geometrical routes, to actually <coughs> make something useful. So, uh, for the alchemical route, because we are in the alchemical chapter, uh, uh, we're gonna we're gonna uh, look at this uh, this equilibrium here. Went a bit too fast, but. Uh, um, so the idea here is, is the following, and that goes back to uh, original work from Jan Hermans. Uh, maybe I should replay this slide. I want your attention to focus on uh, the, uh, the thermodynamic cycle here, and also on this little box here. So the idea is we're going to do alchemical transformation. Mm -hmm. Alchemical transformation, we're going to make the ligand disappear on the left-hand side in the unbound state, in the free state, bulk state, on the right hand side, in the bound state. Now, uh, I would like to draw your attention to this little, uh, mm -hmm. this little animation, uh, which we call the floating ligand problem. So what's happening is, when I decouple, when I do my transformation whereby I decouple, I annihilate the uh, ligand in the bound state, so when I decouple it, basically I kind of loosen the interaction energy, and so the ligand starts to float away. Per se, it's not a problem. It becomes a problem when I want to do the reverse transformation, the creation transformation, because now the starting point is the ligand being far away from the protein, and uh, the chance that when I recouple the ligand to the protein, it will never reappear where I expect it to be, right? Therefore, violating the principle of thermodynamic <coughs> microreversibility. So, uh, our philosophy is: uh, if you cannot simulate it, restrain it. And that's what we're going to do here in this cycle. So, when I put a little zero here as the superscript, it means it's the free ligand. If I put a star, it means it's a restrained ligand. So, what I'm going to do here in this in this uh, in this thermodynamic cycle. Uh, before I actually uh, calculate the, uh, uh, the alchemical, the true alchemical uh, free energy, which is the uh, annihilation uh, going in that direction or the creation going in the upwards direction, I'm going to impose some restraints. Uh, I'm going to restrain the ligand in its native conformation in the, uh, in the protein ligand complex, in its native orientation, in its native position. So how do, how do we do that? <coughs> I'm sorry. So how do we do that in practice? Um, so we have um, we have the protein, we have uh, we have the ligand uh, bound to the protein. We're gonna first freeze the conformation of the ligand, and then we're gonna introduce some groups of atoms in the protein and in the uh, and in the ligand to define the position the orientation of the ligand with respect to the protein. Okay. Uh, so restraining the position, uh, restraining the conformation, we do that with an RMSD. Uh, restraining the, uh, the, the orientation, we, we do that with the Euler angles, the three Euler angles. And, and defining and restraining the position, we do that with the uh, usual spherical coordinates. So R, theta, and, uh, and phi, the, 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 uh, the polar angles and the distance. And only then I can make my ligand vanish uh, in the uh, in the bound state. And of course, in the bulk, the only thing that counts here is the uh, is the uh, is the conformation. So uh, to, uh, to, to 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 summarize, uh, I would have to do a decoupling uh, or two decoupling uh, transformations. So I have to decouple the ligand from the protein in uh, in this system, right? And I also have to decouple the ligand in the unbound state in this system, the bulk state. Okay, so those are like the uh, the, the, the green transformation. And then, uh, because I have imposed some restraints uh, uh, so that the ligand is in the uh, the native conformation, the native orientation, and the native position, well, all of these restraints basically contribute to uh, remove some configurational entropy, right? So this configurational entropy uh, actually contributes to the binding free energy. So that I have to take into account. So I need to calculate the contribution due to these restraints. So this is what you have here 
in, uh, in orange. And then what are these purple terms? Well, um, I need to balance what I'm doing on the left-hand side of my thermodynamic cycle and what I'm doing on the right-hand side. So on the left hand, on the right-hand side, in the bound state, I have this orientational contribution for the restraints and this positional uh, uh, contribution for the, uh, for the restraints, right? Uh, for the bulk, well, I also need that, therefore. So what I'm doing is, uh, but, but in the bulk state, is, we're just talking about uh, uh, translation and rotation, tumbling of a rigid body in, in, a, in a bulk environment. And this can be calculated analytically. So that's the usual integral, uh, integral of uh, r square uh, d theta dr d theta d phi r square sine theta, uh, uh, and that's it. So I just integrate that. Uh, so I introduce the solid angle and, and, and so on, and that's that's pretty uh, that's pretty straightforward. Okay, but so that's that's the uh, that's the difficult part. Maybe you want to do uh, things a little bit uh, uh, easier. So uh, as you can see in this uh, in this animation, we are in the cavity of neuraminidase, and uh, we are transforming uh, one drug into another one. We're transforming Tamiflu into Relanza, which were the the, 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 the blockbusters that were used to fight avian flu. Uh, so in this case, uh, we, uh, we, 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 we look at this, uh, we consider this thermodynamic cycle uh, to calculate the relative binding affinity. So we're no longer interested in the absolute quantities, which we just calculated uh, in the previous slide. Uh, we are actually interested in uh, these quantities. So the transformation of ligand A into ligand B in the bound state and in the unbound state. And so the difference, the delta delta G, the difference between uh, this one and that one, actually, uh, yeah, that's, that's right, this one and that one uh, is equal to the difference between uh, the horizontal lens, okay? And that's much easier to carry out. Uh, that's cheaper. Um, it's particularly well suited for congeneric uh, compounds. So it's, if the, the, the compounds are very similar, and you just change one decoration, let's say you add a CH3, you replace a hydrogen by a CH3, or you replace an OH by an OCH3, or that is, that's like the best method for, uh, it's, it's fast and, 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 and usually it converges, uh, it converges pretty quickly. Sometimes, sometimes, uh, especially uh, when there is a change that the binding pose uh, may change, uh, it may, uh, you may need to introduce some geometric uh, restraints. Uh, and of course, then you will have to calculate the contribution of these restraints to the delta delta G. Now, what you can do for the guest, you can also do for the, uh, for the host. And so uh, imagine that uh, you have a protein and you, you want, and, and this protein uh, binds a certain ligand, and you want to see the effect of a, uh, of, a, of a mutation, a spontaneous mutation. Actually, this is what we looked at for neuraminidase, uh, because neuraminidase, uh, uh, well, the, the virus at some point, by some combinatorial effect, uh, uh, thought that uh, maybe uh, uh, it should change, it should evolve, it should mutate to resist to uh, one of the two drugs. So we found out that there were some uh, some mutations, spontaneous mutation that made it uh, completely, uh, that made Rilanza completely innocuous to the virus, but Tamiflu was still effective. Uh, it couldn't, actually a single mutation couldn't uh, uh, annihilate the effect of the two drugs at the same time. So in this case, what we do is, uh, uh, again, we, uh, we, we, what the mutation is, uh, we mutate the protein, so we change one, of, one amino acid in the uh, in the uh, unbound state, and we change the uh, the amino uh, the amino acid of the protein in the bound state, and again we calculate the delta delta G. Okay. So far, so good. Okay. Uh, okay. So now, how about entropy? So uh, this is a free energy uh, calculation lecture, but. Uh, Sometimes you can get the entropy for the price of the uh, of the free energy calculation, or slightly slightly more. So there is a there's a there's a paper by the by the Carpers group from the uh, the beginning of the 2000s, but they actually uh, take the uh, the Zwanzig Landau 
uh, expression of the free energy and kind of restate it, rewrite it, and uh, to get the to, to get the delta s. Now, as you can see, uh, if you if you do that, uh, and the expression of course is a bit more complicated, but most importantly, uh, uh, you introduce uh, these averages here, this uh, average of, of u zero, uh, and uh, let's face it, I mean this converges much slower than uh, the uh, the average of a of a of a difference. Uh, so, these calculations, I mean, entropy calculations usually are prone to convergence issues because now you're not just considering the perturbation, but you're considering also the entire energy. So, it's not just, so imagine that you're doing a protein ligand. It's not just about the protein ligand interaction, which is embodied in the delta U. It's also U itself. So, it means like the protein, the ligand, and their environment. So in, in that, you're throwing all the solute, solvent, and solvent-solvent interactions. And, and that, that converges very slowly. So uh, if you look here, uh, this is uh, the hydration-free energy of, uh, if I remember correctly, of methanol. Uh, yeah, that's methanol. Um, so what you have here is the, uh, the free energy. Uh, and as you can see, after eight nanoseconds, we, 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 we have converged after eight nanoseconds. This is the experimental value. Uh, this is what the force field gives you. Force field not quite, uh, quite there, but it's not too bad. But if you look at, uh, at the calculation of the internal energy delta U of hydration, or of the entropy minus T delta S, you have to invest quite a bit, uh, of course, I mean, this is still cheap by comparison with big simulations of proteins. And, but still, I mean, compared to the free energy, you have to invest quite a bit. I mean, we're talking, in this case, of a factor of about 10. It's 10 times more expensive to get in the particular case. I don't want to make that a rule of thumb. But in this particular case of uh, the, the, the hydration of methanol, it's about a factor of 10, uh, the, the, the computational investment to get the, uh, to get the entropy. Uh, there is an alternate route. Uh, I think one of the first simulations was done by, uh, by Ron Levy. Uh, and in this case, what you have to do is to run uh, different free energy uh, calculations at different temperature, and then you use uh, the linear approximation. So you calculate uh, the delta S as a finite, uh, as a finite difference. So basically, the free energy at T1, the free energy at T2, divided by the different T2 and T1. Uh, one of the exercises, uh, I think that's one of the exercises that, that, that you will have to do, is uh, uh, to study hydration uh, <coughs> of a small solute. So this is, uh, this is the case of ethanol. And the way we do it from an alchemical point of view is, uh, so we make it disappear, or we make it appear uh, 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 in the vacuum state and in the, uh, in the, uh, in the aqueous state. To complete the thermodynamic cycle, so um, so the setup is very simple. So you have your you have your box of water with your with your ethanol, and progressively, using lambda from lambda equals zero to lambda equals one, you make it disappear, and you make it reappear. Uh, why do I need to complete the full cycle? So why do I need to calculate actually? Why do I need to do this transformation in the vacuum? Does someone have an idea? Solvent. What's that? The effect of the solvent. Uh, not quite. So the <laughs> summation of all the delta Gs have to equal zero. Yeah, that's that's kind of a tautology. I mean, that's uh, yes, you need to complete the cycle. Yes, that's that's. Uh, but why do you need specifically to? to do it to do the transformation in the vacuum. You could, for instance, and that's actually uh, hidden in this uh, in this variable here that is available in MD, I'll decouple off, I'll decouple on. You could basically that controls the uh, the non-bonded interaction. If you put I'll decouple on, it means that you will you will ignore 
the change in the, 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 the non-bonded interaction. The, sorry, the intramolecular, sorry, the intramolecular non-bonded interaction. You ignore that. Well, I mean, you don't know the path in water. Um, so, like, if you had, if you go from vacuum to water, you're just adding water to the system, but you can have a different path if you're going from... Not quite. In, no, it's really an intra in, intramolecular question. Okay, I'm going to give you the, I'm going to take myself a chocolate and then I continue. <laughs> so, um, the reason is very simple. Uh, if you have if you have a very rigid molecule, it doesn't matter because uh, whether you are in vacuum or in water, it's rigid, so it's not going to change its composition. But if you have a very flexible molecule, uh, that's a different story. So remember the Onzaga law that relates the electrostatic free energy to the dipole moment of the molecule. It varies as the square of the dipole moment. In other words. If you are in vacuum, the molecule will adopt uh, a conformation that minimizes its dipole moment. Whereas when it's in a high dielectric, high permittivity environment, it will adopt a conformation that maximizes its dipole moment. In other words, in vacuum and in water, you will have very different conformations, therefore very different intramolecular interactions. Assuming that you have the same intramolecular interaction in water and in vacuum is just wrong. Okay, that that's what you need to do. Both. That will be the case of most of these calculations. That will be that will be the case of most of these calculations. Exactly. Okay. Uh, another thing that I would like to draw your attention to is uh, when we say we do the calculation in vacuum. This is not exactly vacuum. We're still doing that in a lattice. We're still using a lattice. To be fully compatible, this lattice should be, should have the, the cell should have the same size. To be, to, be, uh, to be consistent, to be congruent with the calculation on the right-hand side, you want to have the, the, the box size. It's a box, it's a real box, except that it's an empty box. It only contains the solute. But you still have the interaction between, of the solute between the cells. And so if you do that, then uh, this is what you get, and then you can do your so you can do your annihilation, you do your creation, and then you can combine the statistics of the two to get the bar estimator and get minus 4.4, experiment minus 5.1, and voila. So um, just like in any experiment, is a good practice. You want to accompany uh, your free energy calculations, the, the results of your free energy calculation, with an error estimate, and you should make a you should make a, a distinction between statistical and systematic error. There are two sources of errors in in uh, in your free energy calculation: errors coming from uh, uh, statistics, and that's usually the variance, and error coming from the so-called systematic error, which is everything else, like simulation, the finite length effect of the simulation. The force field, that's systematic. Uh, let me give you an example, just so that you see the difference. Imagine that um, you have a solute that is flexible. And let's say that, to make it simple, let's say that this solute can assume to or adopt two different, two distinct conformations. But its two conformations contribute importantly to the uh, hydration free energy, and you want to calculate the hydration free energy. The problem is that in the course of the simulation, uh, because the barrier, the torsional barrier, is too high, and you don't do anything special to actually promote isomerization, uh, uh, in the course of a standard length simulation, you will either see this conformation or that conformation, but you will not see the isomerization from here. So, in terms of statistical, so you can do a pretty long simulation, still be stuck in that conformation. Uh, in terms of statistical error, uh, you will do a pretty good job uh, because the statistical error will reflect your ability to sample all the, 
all the configuration of the solvent around the molecule, around the solute of interest. Right? And, 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 and for that, you're doing a good job. You're doing a lousy job in terms of systematic error because your simulation is too short and you will never see the other conformation. So, so your free energy will be, uh, will be uh, erroneous uh, because you're missing an, an important contribution uh, by not sampling the ultimate conformation. Do you see the difference? So from a statistical point of view, nice. From a, from a systematic point of view, lousy. But that can be solved. I mean, there are there are options. I was talking about REST. Uh, REST is a, is a, is a, is an algorithm exploiting you know replicas to help you uh, actually cross the barrier. Uh, you can use Benoit Roux's boosting potential. So the boosting potential is uh, you do a separate energy calculation whereby you estimate the torsional barrier and you feed this torsional barrier in the course of your FEP calculation. And so your molecule will keep isomerizing in the course of the, uh, of the simulation. So you will sample those states. And then you just unbias, because this is a bias that you've introduced in the calculation. So you need to remove it from the uh, a posteriori. Uh, you, you remove this bias. Uh, so uh, there are different ways to, uh, to, to estimate the, uh, the systematic error. I don't want to go into uh, into uh, into the details, especially we don't we don't have much time, but I'm more than happy to answer questions this afternoon if you're if you're really into this. Um, you want to stratify. That's the, now I think that you're all convinced that you need to stratify uh, uh, to reduce the variance and improve the uh, the overlap of your ensembles, and you want to combine forward and backward simulations. Uh, to uh, to reduce the variance and get the maximum likelihood uh, estimate. Last thing, uh, this is a very good example. Uh, I, I wanted to show that because uh, this plugin exists because of you guys. Uh, this was born actually in a in a very similar workshop in Atlanta, and the combination of you know having a heterogeneous uh, uh, audience of experimentalists and and, and theorists allowed. To do that, uh, um, we had people from experiments, and they were very interested in fringy calculations, but they didn't want to to know the fine detail of the fringy calculation. And I can understand that. I mean, you know, this is your job, this is my job. I mean, we have different jobs, different specialties, but they wanted to 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 be able to predict the effect of of uh, alanine uh, uh, point mutations, which which you can use. They, they are called in general. Alanine scanning experiments, you can use them in the context of protein substrate binding. So in this case, you you uh, you mutate in your protein the uh, um, some uh, some some residues that are interacting with the ligand and and see uh, what are the important residues uh, contributing to the binding, or you can use them in the so-called TSAs uh, thermal uh, thermal shift or uh, uh, assays. Uh, 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 to see uh, if uh, some uh, uh, some mutations are prone to uh, destabilize uh, the protein and, and take the protein towards an unfolded state. So what we did is uh, we actually built this uh, this uh, this piece of uh, this, this plugin that is now part of, uh, of 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 VMD, and you can you can uh, you just enter your, uh, uh, your your PSF and PDB file. And, uh, and then you select the, uh, the, the amino acids that you want to, uh, to mutate, and, and, and it will prepare all the calculations. You just have to run them. And afterwards, it, it does the analysis, and it will show you, will have like little flags. It will show two things. It will show, uh, so here you have a, a color gradient uh, a scale uh, for, the, uh, for the mutations. So uh, uh, you have like uh, you're going from very favorable mutations in blue to a very unfavorable mutation in in, in in red. That's what you have here, and then you have these little dots like just traffic lights, basically telling you well this calculation I think it's not converged. So just by looking at the systematic error, looking at the hysteresis, uh, uh, this calculation in red definitely not converged. You better redo it. In green you're pretty safe. In orange, mm, be careful. Uh, so, the, but the idea was like basically to take you uh, by the hand 
uh, all the way through from the construction, from the setting up of the, uh, the simulations, all the way to the post facto uh, uh, analysis of the simulations. Okay, so now uh, we have uh, less, than, uh, less than an hour, so I have to, to rush. Uh, we're going to talk about geometrical uh, fringe calculations. I'm sorry, I'm very talkative. Uh, so, um, and I, I'm saddened actually to, uh, to start this, uh, with this first slide, uh, uh, talking about uh, reaction coordinate and, and mentioning uh, David Chandler, uh, who worked for a long time on this. He passed away yesterday. Uh, so David Chandler, you may know him uh, from his uh, statistical mechanics book, very famous uh, statistical mechanics book, and also for his work, his immense work on transition path sampling. If you've heard about the word transition path sampling, that's David Chandler in Berkeley. Uh, and so, uh, and I want to talk uh, uh, about the notion of, of a reaction coordinates. And, and perhaps try to uh, entice you to, to use the proper vocabulary. Uh, when we talk about reaction coordinator, what, what are we talking about really? I mean, reaction coordinate, the true reaction coordinate, is usually a, a, refers to a, a mathematical object that lives in uh, R3F. So uh, uh, it's a pretty complex, uh, it's a pretty complex thing. It's not. Sometimes we we hear, oh, my reaction coordinate was. Uh, Z, the direction is really Z. No, uh, reaction coordinate is much more complex than that. Uh, if you think about, for instance, uh, this guy here, uh, this is a peptide nanotube, uh, so made of cyclic peptides that are piled uh, and, and connected through a network of hydrogen bonds. And you can see here a close up on an ion, a, a chloride ion uh, uh, translocating. In this uh, in this peptide uh, nanotube, uh, you could say, of course, I mean, the, my reaction coordinate is the uh, long axis of this uh, of this uh, of this uh, hollow cavity. But that's not true. I mean, that's uh, that's uh, uh, very uh, it's a reduction of the uh, of, of the true reaction coordinate. There are many other degrees of freedom that participate to uh, to this reaction coordinate, uh, chief amongst which the uh, coordination of the ion by the, uh, by the different uh, amino groups of, uh, of the cyclic peptides that, that really contributes to the uh, uh, that really contributes to the free energy, right? So you can make your reaction coordinate model a little bit more sophisticated by instead of considering just the long axis, you could also consider the radial the radial uh, direction. The reason you want to consider the radial direction is very simple. If you use if you use the uh, just the long axis, but you want to drag the uh, drag reversibly the uh, the ion along the long axis of the uh, of the uh, of the nanotube, right? But at some point, it will be chelated by the uh, by the amino groups, and these amino groups will kind of thwart the uh, kind of hamper the diffusion in the nanotube. Okay, so one way to prevent that is also sample in the uh, orthogonal direction, what I call rho. And, and, uh, and as you can see, you better do that to, to actually, uh, as you can see here, uh, if, if I look at the motion of the, uh, 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 of the ion, it's not a rectilinear motion, it's actually zigzagging, which is kind of also uh, 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 can be seen here by this, uh, this energy jumps uh, in the in the free energy in the two-dimensional free energy profile. So, really careful when you say, "Well, I use that as a reaction coordinate." Reaction coordinates are actually much more complicated than what you what you think. What you're using, I, I like to use the word transition coordinate. It's just like a or reaction coordinate model. Uh, and um, why are people like David Chandler very adamant about the use uh, of the proper vocabulary? Well, there is one reason. Uh, you can use any transition coordinates uh, if you're just interested in thermodynamics. Uh, we, we said that as a preamble to this lecture, that uh, the reaction pathway doesn't matter as long as you are interested in the free energy difference, right? 
I mean, some of them are more ludicrous than others, but uh, but the, doesn't really matter what uh, where you, through which pathway you go. Uh, the important thing is the free energy difference between the two basins. But if you're interested in kinetics, then you are really in trouble, and you better get the correct uh, reaction coordinate because now we're talking about measuring barriers. And depending on where you go, the barriers will be can be really substantial, right? So uh, you can make an inference, and you know basically say, well, I think that this combination of collective variables uh, give me a pretty good representation of my reaction coordinate. Okay, it's a pretty good model. Okay, and then you calculate you calculate your your your, your free energy profile. And now we're going to calculate, we're going to verify a posteriori that my guess was a reasonable one. And this is what we call a committer analysis. And that's also from David Chandler. So the idea here is to run a series of molecular dynamic simulation. And uh, we're going to consider different values of psi of my uh, reaction coordinate model. So I'm going to place myself here. So that would be 0.469. I'm going to pl place myself here, 0.49. That's really on the top of the barrier. And I'm going to place myself here. And so, as you can see, when I'm on the top of the barrier, I really have like a nice, uh, a nice distribution. Whereas when I'm slightly on the left, it's completely shifted to the right. And when I'm here, it's completely shifted to the left. So basically, uh, when I'm on top of the barrier and I'm shooting many trajectories, I have an equal chance to go either on the left or on the right. If I'm slightly on the left, then I'm going back to the uh, to the uh, to the to the reactants. Whereas if I'm slightly on the right, I'm mostly going to the products. Okay, so that's that's something you want is also is a good practice just to verify that, that your reaction coordinate model is not completely uh, out to lunch, okay? So uh, on the menu of uh, what we have in, uh, in, uh, in NAMD through the uh, COLVARS, the collective variable modules, we have, we have variables of, of increased collectivity going from dist Euclidean distances, something very simple, uh, uh, projected distances, a distance, uh, Euclidean distance projected onto the z-axis or projected onto the xy plane, to uh, angles, to dihedrals, and then we increase the collectivity. We have uh, RMSDs, uh, gyration radii, and all the way to uh, eigenvectors. So the eigenvector that you can obtain, for instance, from uh, an NMA. Uh, 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 network, uh, no, that's not NMA, it's uh, ENM, or Elastic Network Model, sorry. No, but NMA is, what's no. NMA? No more model. No more model, that's, sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry, it's um, Alzheimer. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, so one thing that you have to be very, uh, very careful uh, or pay attention uh, of is, uh, these variables, like RMSD, are highly degenerate variables. So um, think about it in terms of the so-called uh, folding funnels of Peter Walliness. Um, you can have very different conformation. An RMSD is a scalar, but for one particular value of this scalar, you can have very different conformations. So uh, in terms of sampling, you really have to pay attention to what you're doing. I mean, I, I'm not saying that you shouldn't use these variables, but you have to you have to know what you're doing. Uh, uh, it's not it doesn't discriminate very well between between different conformations. So you have to be aware of that. That for one value, for one value of the RMSD, this is the folded state, and these are uh, an ensemble of unfolded state that can correspond to the same value of the RMSD, but yet they're very different, very different conformations. Um, another example to uh, to illustrate the complexity of uh, of uh, of uh, an unmodeled reaction coordinate. So we showed recently that uh, uh, in the rotaxanes. Are you familiar with rotaxanes? So rotaxanes were basically the uh, the object of the Nobel prizes in chemistry this year with Jean-Pierre Sauvage and 
and Stoddard. Uh, those are like these little molecular machines, and Rotaxin is a, essentially a, uh, a molecular wire, molecular uh, thread, uh, onto which you're threading a, uh, a cavity, typically a cyclodextrin. And uh, the cyclodextrin, you can, so you can use that as a switch. And uh, so the idea is you have stoppers, and you have uh, you have stations, and then so along the wire, and in the middle usually you have like a, a, a group. Uh, so if you have like a cyclodextrin, we, uh, the, uh, the the cavity of which is highly hydrophobic, so in the middle of the, the thread you're using like a bipyridinium, which is like a highly charged uh, group. And so it doesn't like to, to go over it uh, uh, because it's like an unfavorable uh, interaction. And so uh, this, uh, this rotaxanes, these little molecular switches, can be activated uh, through different ways. It can be pH activated, it can be temperature activated, it can be a photon activated, and, and, uh, and, uh, and there are different rates, of course. You have like these barriers to cross corresponding to the uh, uh, unfavorable interactions. But uh, what we saw is that uh, uh, as it moves along the, uh, along the thread, it's not just like pure translation. It's a translation and a rotation at the same time. And if you're trying to just simulate the, 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 the motion uh, of, of the cyclodextrin along the thread in terms of a pure translation, it's going to be very hard. Because you're assuming that you're, so you're basically assuming that you're averaging the rotation of the, of the cyclodextrin. And that's not prone to happen, depending on the nature of the cyclodextrin. So you really have to introduce another collective variable to, uh, to, to do that. Uh, the same thing for something as simple as, uh, as, uh, as uh, this uh, small peptide. I'm going to see that in a minute. This is Deca Alani. And uh, if you really want to study the, uh, the, 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 the unfolding of uh, the complete unfolding and refolding of this uh, of this deca alanine, you better go. You better increase the dimensionality of uh, of your uh, of your of your reaction coordinator. A simple end-to-end -end distance is is not enough. Yes. If you want to simulate one of those cases where you have actually like the reaction is in two dimensions, if do you have to similar with two reaction uh, two reaction coordinates, or can you like? Uh, that it's, 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 it, it's one reaction coordinate made of two var two collective variables. Uh, sure, but uh, do you have to follow that, or can you like only run like, into one reaction coordinate and evaluate it in the other? No, the way we do it is we actually mapping the full two dimensional. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. We're gonna we're gonna see that in a minute. Okay, I want to also mention something. So since we are talking about transition path sampling, uh, I, I, uh, I want to illustrate uh, or, or give you one method to actually try to guess what's the reaction coordinate, or what's the, uh, what's the best model of the reaction coordinate. And one of the methods that, uh, that is used uh, is the string method. Uh, and, and, and I'm going to talk about a variant of the string method. So the string method is from Eric van den Eyden in New York. And, uh, and the variant is actually from the group of Ben Maru. Uh, so this is called the string method with swarms of trajectory. Uh, if you want the detail, again, uh, I'm not going to go through this slide. We can talk about it uh, uh, during the tutorials this afternoon. I just want to illustrate it. The basic idea of the string method with swarm the trajectory is the following. So let's illustrate it with a very simple example. This is dialanine. This is the free energy landscape of dialanine, which can, which has like these two uh, uh, free energy basins corresponding, so called uh, C7 equatorial, C7 axial, because it forms like a pseudo uh, C7 uh, seven member ring, uh, whereby the uh, the oxygen here uh, interacts with the uh, hydrogen here. Okay, so we have axial, we have equatorial. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna guess. Uh, this is a very rough guess. This is just a straight line going from C7 equatorial to C7 axial. Uh, this is my guess string. Um, so I prepare I prepare my string and prepare the beads 
here along the string, which we, we call them images. Uh, this is just a linear combination of the phi and psi angles. Uh, and uh, so I have like here, I probably have like something like 20, 20 images. So now what I'm going to do here is uh, uh, for each bead, for each image, I generate, uh, so I do a restrain MD at uh, this particular values of phi and psi. I equilibrate, uh, and then I will uh, generate a swarm of trajectory for each, uh, for each image. Okay, so those are very short simulations, very short. And from this simulation, from this swarm of trajectory, I calculate an average drift. This average drift will help me actually infer the direction towards which I have to evolve my string uh, uh, to get the minimum action, the minimum free energy pathway. So um, I do that uh, iteratively. So I do uh, image by image, or I can do that also in parallel. There is no actually requirement to do it in parallel, but uh, uh, can do it in parallel. So I do that for the, for the 20 images. And that's my first iteration. Then I get the different drifts. I evolve my string. I reparameterize the string. It's important that the beads are, the images are equally, or, uh, or they are equidistant. And then I get the next string. And then I go again and I regenerate new swarms of trajectories. Okay? So uh, to show you in a little movie how things work, so this is the starting point. And now I'm going to evolve my string. So you can, you can see that. This is a poor guess because I'm, I'm going through the maximum of the free energy. I don't want that. Nature hates uh, uh, to go through high energy barriers. So I'm evolving this. Uh, and um, and uh, slowly but surely, it will actually go through. It will, it will, it will find a passageway uh, that corresponds to the minimum effort. Okay. And Yes. Can I just make a short question? You mentioned that for each beat you do a strain simulation, or is it just a regular simulation? Yes, that to, prepare them, to prepare them, oh, to prepare them, just to prepare it. And now, I mean, the master is back, so uh, this is actually is, uh, oh, no, not yet, not yet, not yet, <laughs> <laughs> not yet. Uh, so, yeah, what, what do we do with that? Uh, what do we do with this uh, with this string? So uh, I have my I have my string, so it's optimized now. Well, I can I can uh, I have some variables which are called pass collective variables, and that has been cooked up by uh, the Parinello group uh, um, to basically uh, uh, follow the string and calculate the free energy along the string. Now you have to be careful because. Uh, uh, so we try to follow the string, but uh, depending on the shape of the string, maybe we can go astray and, uh, and uh, far, actually, from the string. So there is a secondary variable that you can introduce, we can, which basically you can see as doing sampling in a tube that embraces the string. And that kind of, you can see that as a zeta, you can see zeta as a restraint to prevent sampling to go too far from the string. So you basically generate a two-dimensional map, right? And then you integrate in the other direction to get uh, the free energy uh, along S, uh, the, uh, the actual uh, uh, collective variable for the string. And now, uh, not yet. <laughs> uh, so this is this is this is the uh, this is our string, and, uh, and this is the kind of free energy profile that you get. I just want to emphasize again uh, that. Uh, when you're just interested in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, a free energy difference, uh, um, it doesn't matter which pathway you choose. So uh, if you just uh, if you just take a two-dimensional uh, free energy map, if you do a real free energy calculation in two dimension in phi m psi, and you integrate uh, between the two basins, you get 2.5 kcal. And it so happens that if you do the pass collective variable. Uh, you also get a free energy difference of 2.5 Okay? So far, so good. So now, for the, <laughs> the master. Uh, so uh, this is, a, this is a, what you're seeing here is, a, is the so-called chromatophore, 
which you may have heard of, which is uh, the apparatus that is used by nature by certain bacteria, for the bactospheroides, to uh, transform uh, light energy to chemical energy. And, uh, and what you can see here in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the chromatophore is ATPase. And ATPase is the uh, machinery, is the molecular motor that is used for synthesis of uh, ATP from ADP. And or it's a reversible motor. It can also be used for uh, a, a hydrolysis of ATP into, into ADP. So what, uh, what Avicek uh, did is actually use, and I think that's the, uh, the, the most heroic use of, of the string method uh, so far, uh, is the application of the string method to, uh, um, to study the, uh, the to, to define the transition pathway uh, uh, corresponding to the, uh, to, to the hydrolysis of, uh, of ATP into, into ADP. So what you can see here, this part, is actually what we call the crown or the uh, A3V3 ring. And as you can see, you can see the breathing. Uh, so um, just to give you the, 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 the little detail, uh, so you have like a three uh, AB interfaces. Uh, so constantly they are, uh, they are uh, one of them is, uh, contains ADP plus P, one of them contains ATP, and one of them is empty. And it kind of, uh, so when, ADP, uh, when ATP is idolized into ADP, then the product goes away, then it becomes empty, waiting for ATP to come in, and so on and so forth. It works by a cycle of 120 degrees. And in, in this process, you have like a lot of breathing, you know, like opening and closing of these interfaces, which in turn uh, uh, promotes the motion of the, uh, which you can see here, in, uh, inter intermittently, uh, the shaft. So the shaft is this uh, also called the, uh, uh, this, uh, the, uh, the uh, domain here, uh, the central stock. And this central stock, uh, uh, Thing that you, that, that you can see are uh, rotating. Right? Okay, uh, so now, now that we have defined collective variables and reaction coordinates, what do we do with them? So you have again on the menu a number of methods that you can use. Uh, so uh, the first class of method is. Uh, 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 basically belong to the, it's the same class, actually it's the same method. Uh, metadynamics, in fact, as ancestors, so metadynamics was proposed in 2001, 2002 by, by uh, Michele Parinello, but the same method actually existed, uh, was, was cooked up in 1995 by Helmut Kohlmüller, and at the same time, or at the same time, by uh, Wilfred von Ginstrand, with the name local elevation or conformational flooding. And uh, this is basically what you're trying to do. You're basically trying to flood the free energy landscape using some Gaussians. And, uh, and basically the idea is at the end, <coughs> once everything is flooded, you evolve. And you keep, of course, a memory. You have a memory kernel of, of what you have flooded. And, and, and basically at the end, you evolve on a flat uh, free energy uh, landscape. Uh, different idea, uh, uh, although the, the, you're basically trying to, 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 to achieve the same result. Uh, uh, these two guys are uh, uh, Glenn Torrey and John Vallow. Uh, umbrella sampling, that's a much older method, 19, 1977. What I'm going to show you is the real umbrella sampling and not what people call today umbrella sampling, uh, uh, erroneously. Uh, the original umbrella sampling actually really had an umbrella. Today, we don't use umbrellas. But at the time of Tori and Vallow, so uh, the idea was to, to, to guess a, uh, a biasing potential that could help overcome uh, the free energy barrier. So how do we do that in practice? Uh, well, first thing, we're going to do, uh, we're going to do, uh, uh, we're going to use the Vallow and Card uh, idea of 1972, which is essentially the same thing, the same ID that I was mentioning for perturbation theory, which is stratification. Uh, we cannot just do a simulation for the entire pathway that would be like too large, too long, 
So we're going to just cut the uh, reaction pathway into windows. And these windows have to overlap. And I'm going to say why in a minute. OK, so uh, that's the first stage. So we're going to define uh, windows. And we're going to confine sampling in these windows by means of a harmonic potential on each side, by means of a wall. Okay. And now the second part is to define the umbrella. And the umbrella should be exactly, but you have to guess that, should be exactly the negative of the free energy. So that when you add the biasing potential, when you add the umbrella to the actual uh, force field, then the result is a flat free energy landscape. And again, the idea is to evolve on a flat free energy landscape guided by the uh, self-diffusion properties of your, of your system, right? So once you have that, then, then you can recover. So you get your biasing, uh, you can, you, so you, you basically histogram. It's a, it's, it, it belongs to the histogram uh, class of method. And so uh, once you have that, so you have your uh, biased probability distribution, and you recover the free energy by taking the logarithm of that. And whatever biasing potential you have introduced in your calculation, you have to remove it from your, uh, from your, uh, from your calculation. Now, why do, you, why do we need to have this, um, this uh, overlap between uh, windows? Because we're dealing with the free energy, and the free energy is defined up to a constant. So it's very possible that when you recover the free energy in window one, you'll have something like this. And in window two, you'll have a jump to the second part of the free energy. And then maybe another jump. So you need this, this, this overlap region to actually paste things together, which you can do by hand. You can write a little program that will minimize the curvature in the overlapping region. Or you can use the so-called ferenberg swenson equations, which are uh, self-consistent equation, also known as weighted histogram analysis method, or WAM. For your information, if you heard about M-bar, M-bar is very similar to WAM. Those are like also kind of self-consistent equations, wherein you just introduce your probability distribution for the different windows and the biasing potential that you've used in the different windows. And you bootstrap that uh, with, with, uh, with, uh, with one free energy difference, and, and then you solve iteratively this, uh, this, this equations. So that's the real umbrella sampling. Now, what people call today umbrella sampling is a super stratification of the reaction pathway. Now, now we're going to use tons of windows, very small windows usually. So if this is a distance, we're using like maybe one angstrom windows that are also overlapping. The reason we do, you use these very small windows, uh, um, then you don't need to define an umbrella because within, within one window, the free energy difference, I mean, if you look at the, uh, the change in free energy, it's less than KT, so it's something that you can easily sample with Boltzmann sampling, right? So the only thing you have to do here is just introduce the, uh, the, the confinement potential, and that's, uh, that's enough. And then you feed that to, uh, to the WAM equations, and you're good to go. Uh, another method that uh, I, I want to talk about, yes? Just back in the day, there were a lot of people uh, from, like, you know, like now, of course, like, you know, it's pretty fine to the Oh, I, so there were, there, there were intermediates. I mean, there were variants of, uh, of the umbrella sampling between uh, then and now. I mean, for instance, uh, a good example is Martin Karplus, uh, 1997, uh, with, um, with an adaptive umbrella sampling. So it was still the ID, the, the Tori Valo ID of, of guessing the, uh, the, the, the umbrella, but guessing it iteratively. So basically running a simulation, getting the probability distribution, and, 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 and seeing if you get a uniform, because uh, that's Ultimately, that's the, that's the criterion. What you want to have is when you add the biasing potential, when you add the biasing potential to the force field, you want to get a uniform probability distribution across the window. If your probability distribution is completely skewed, it means that you completely messed up the, uh, the, your guess of the, uh, of the biasing potential. 
And so iteratively, they just you know modify the uh, the. Uh, so if you use, for instance, a ramp, they modify the uh, the slope of the ramp, uh, and run again a short simulation until they actually get the. Uh, so you can find that it's Bartels, and Bartels and Carpus 1997. That's the adaptive umbrella sampling. So, uh, so this is another method, belonging to a totally different class of methods. So, uh, umbrella sampling, histogramming. This is this belongs to the class of gradient-based methods. So the idea here is you define your reaction coordinate model. So what you see here is the uh, is the uh, unfolding, reversible unfolding of uh, Deca Adani. I'm gonna replay. The, uh, sorry, I'm going to repeat the movie uh, below. Um, <clears throat> so the idea here is uh, we take the uh, so we take the reaction coordinate here at the uh, model uh, side. We're going to uh, we're going to um, uh, discretize it into small uh, small boxes, so small increments delta psi, and uh, the idea is that. Each value uh, uh, of, of psi that we uh, that uh, that we uh, that we sample, we calculate the force exerted along the reaction coordinate model. Okay, the thermodynamic force, this force. Here. And once we and so we basically uh, we just increment a counter, saying okay, we've been to this value, we we stopped at this value of psi, and this was the value of the force. And I solve my equations of motion, and then maybe I'm an ad, I find myself in the adjacent uh, value of psi, and I increment the counter, and I store the value of the uh, of the force, and so on and so forth. At the beginning, I'm just doing this. This is pure Boltzmann sampling. At some point, I will reach a certain value, a certain threshold uh, for the number of samples per bin, per value of psi. Then I calculate this expected value. And that expected value, that expected value of the force, by definition, is equal to the gradient of the free energy. Right? And that will help me overcome the free energy barrier. That's what you saw in the movie. I mean, maybe it was a little bit too fast, but so at the beginning, I'm, I'm in this I'm in this uh, little valley here, doing Boltzmann sampling. And then I'm applying the bias, and boom, I end up in that region. And then progressively, kind of things kind of uh, arrange themselves, and, and 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 I converge towards the uh, the uh, the fringe, the actual fringe profile, with a so-so <clears throat> with a so-so uniform uh, sampling. If you want to make an analogy, so metadynamics will be flooding, flooding valleys with Gaussians. This will be, you could see that as a bulldozer crushing, crushing snow until you have like a flat, uh, um, a flat uh, free energy landscape. And again, you're evolving on this flat free energy landscape guided by you, by your soul self diffusion properties. So uh, if you want to do, uh, so this, is the, this was the adaptive biasing force method. And so if you want to do a, a fringe calculation with the uh, adaptive biasing force method, you need, as usual, the equilibrated, uh, the files from an equilibrated simulation. You need a colvars.in file. Uh, uh, so that's the file where you define your uh, collective variables. You need, of course, a PSF file, a NAMD file. And then, as an output, you will get the usual NAMD output, and you will get a state file and a trash file. The state file is a, is a file that you can use to restart your simulation. It will write the last state, the last value of the gradient, the last value uh, of the counter for different bins. Um, the trash file gives you actu the actual value of the, uh, of, uh, the uh, reaction coordinate model. Uh, as a function of time. You can also add the value of the force uh, acting along the reaction coordinate model. And then you have like specific file, you have a grad file, a PMF file, and a count file. So the PMF file 
contains the potential of mean force, the free energy change. The grad file contains the gradient, and the count file contains the uh, number of samples per bit along the reaction pathway. Now, I want to impress upon you that uh, as of today, uh, uh, you will get a PMF file only if you have a one-dimensional uh, free energy calculation. If you have a multi-dimensional free energy calculation, you need to do a post-processing. Uh, uh, we do not calculate on the fly. Uh, the, uh, we do not regenerate on the fly the multi-dimensional free energy landscape. You have to do that a posteriori based on the gradient file. Um, and it, it does like a Monte Carlo calculation, Monte Carlo integration to get the, uh, the multi-dimensional uh, free energy profile, free energy landscape. So uh, the example of, of uh, unfolding of decalanine, which you have to uh, work on, or which you may choose to work on this afternoon, uh, if, you, if you wish it so. Uh, so, uh, so this is the unfolding. This is the free energy. Uh, this is the free energy landscape. Um, just to again to give you an idea of uh, uh, what, what what I was talking about in terms of you know, applying the applying the force. So uh, we sampling uh, we uh, sampling uh, the, uh, the the reaction coordinate model psi so that the end to end distance going from 12 to 32 uh, discretized in different bins uh, and here I'm showing the probability distribution of the force so that I get you know uh, I'm storing the force for different values of the of the the reaction coordinate model so at A at B and at C. And what you can see, if I'm at A, uh, uh, my, 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 it's Gaussian distributed, and uh, my, the peak of my Gaussian distribution is slightly on the uh, positive side because my free energy is going down, right? And uh, if I'm at B, uh, it's slightly on the negative side because I'm going up in free energy. And when I'm at C, uh, well, it's almost at zero because it's uh, almost like a flat free energy landscape. One thing I want to mention, uh, when you're doing this calculation, uh, you want to be careful about the contamination of other sources, other forces, and in particular, holonomic constraints. So if you are defining the transition coordinate, uh, you have to be careful that they do not involve atoms that are part of shaken, rattled, uh, uh, degrees of freedom. So, for instance, uh, in the case of uh, decaalanine, if you want to take, for instance, uh, as, a, as a transition coordinate, uh, the, the first C alpha and the last C alpha, well, they are connected to hydrogens. And therefore, this, uh, if you have shake rattle going on, CH is, uh, uh, it, it is frozen. And therefore, uh, you will have contamination of the, uh, of the, uh, the biasing force uh, by this uh, hard degrees of freedom. Okay, so uh, that will that will uh, that will generate an, an erroneous potential of mean force. So either you turn off shake rattle, or what you can do is you take the whole thing instead of taking just the C alpha, you take the C alpha and the H alpha, and in this case you're good to go. You remember the uh, the example that was that, that I was giving about uh, the hydration of uh, of ethanol from a, an alchemical point of view going uh, in the uh, vertical direction. Now you can do the same problem and verify that your thermodynamic cycle closes by doing the horizontal transformation. Of course, the uh, the lower one, nothing to nothing, is nothing. Uh, so uh, to do that, well, you can define as your transition coordinate the uh, projected distance uh, between the center of mass of ethanol and the center of mass of the water lamella projected onto the, the z-axis, right? And that will give you a, uh, a, a potential of uh, a potential of mean force. So this is the uh, this is the uh, the cold var, the collective variable that you define. Oops, too fast. Uh, but, but basically the idea is, so yet you, you get your potential of mean force, and, and, and so you get two plateaus, and the difference between these two plateaus is the hydration free energy. Okay. Uh, now, good practices. 
Uh, if you want to measure binding free energy constants uh, from the point of view of geometric transformation, you will see often in the literature uh, the application of this uh, formula that uh, goes back to an article of Attila Zabo back in 1982, which is basically the uh, integration of the potential of mean force, uh, uh, normalized integration of the potential of mean force over this uh, this area here of, of, of association, which corresponds to the association. So like here, for instance, you have like two benzene. I want I want to uh, to uh, to put a caveat enter here in a, or big a warning sign. Uh, applying this formula is certainly fine for something as simple as benzene. The reason is very simple. This formula, not written, but this formula supposes that uh, you're basically averaging over all possible orientations. Right. So in the case of benzene, I mean the relaxation, the reorientation of time. For benzene is about six to twelve picoseconds, depending if you're looking at the C6 axis or the C2, C2 prime axis. Uh, so you can do that if you do like multi nanosecond simulation, you're good to go. But unfortunately, you see a lot in the literature people applying the same formula for beasts as big as Barney's bar star, and and and, and of course this is not going to work because uh, and, and the argument is the following: the argument is well. You know, in the course of our nanosecond simulation, I don't see them tumbling. Therefore, I can do that. But no, I mean, uh, it's not because you don't see them tumbling that the tumbling doesn't exist. So, uh, assuming, assuming that uh, you have uh, that you have averaged over all possible orientation of protein one with respect to protein two, is just erroneous. So you need to do something different now. Uh, we're going to talk about this. So we're going back to the protein ligand problem that, that you're already familiarized with, but this time we're going to see it from a geometric point of view. And um, so uh, the first step, as uh, before, is freezing the conformation of the ligand with, res uh, uh, with respect to that of the native state. Right? So I'm freezing it. Then I'm also defining again <coughs> Uh, the position and the orientation of the ligand with respect to the protein by introducing uh, groups of atoms in the protein, so three groups of atoms uh, in the protein, three groups of atoms in the uh, in the ligand, um, and so with these three groups of atoms here and there, I can define my usual Euler angles and my uh, my my two polar angles, theta and phi, and so I have to calculate. Potentials of mean force for these different degrees of freedom. So it kind of works like uh, Russian nested dolls. So here's how, how we do it. So we start with the complex, the protein ligand complex, and I'm freezing the conformation of the ligand. So basically, I'm applying as a collective variable the RMSD, and I'm forcing the RMSD. Uh, no, first, I'm calculating the potential of mean force with respect to the RMSD. And that's where you have to pay attention because of the degeneracy of the variable. Now that I have this potential of mean force, so that's my first potential of mean force, the one on top. Then step two, I'm freezing the RMSD. I'm forcing the conformation of the ligand to be that in the native state, in the bound state. Okay. And now I'm calculating the potential of mean force with respect to the first Euler angle. Having done that, step three, I'm freezing the first Euler angle and the RMSD and I'm calculating the potential of mean force of the second Euler angle, and so on and so forth, all the way to separating the ligand from the protein. That's the, that's the magnum opus of the, of the calculation, the more costly part of the calculation, separating. Because here again, uh, using just the distance between the two guys, as, as my transition coordinate is kind of a rough approximation of the actual transition or uh, actual reaction coordinate. I have all these other degrees of freedom that are kind of thwarting the, uh, that kind of uh, impeding the, uh, the, the separation, and namely all the favorable interaction, the salt bridges that exist between the ligand, the, the, the hydrogen bonds that exist between the ligand and the protein. And once I have that, uh, 
I need two more things. I need this, which is again, just like in the perturbation theory, which is the potential of mean force for the RMSD in the bulk state. So what's the reversible work that I have to supply to the system to maintain the conformation, that of the bound state. And then I have this analytical terms corresponding to the translation and to the rotation of a rigid body in a bulk environment. And once I've done that, I, then I just do the bookkeeping and I can calculate my binding constant. Okay? And so this, you can of course apply it not only for protein protein, but uh, for protein ligand, but also for protein protein. So, some good practices. Uh, so, I already said that. So, you want to decouple your xi, your, your, your transition coordinate from any uh, constraints. As a matter of principle, you always want to stratify. You can demonstrate that mathematically. I can refer you to the demonstration that we did using a very simple Brownian motion. Uh, you can show that. Uh, if T0 is the time that is needed to sample the entire reaction pathway, and T prime I is uh, the, 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 the time uh, needed to, uh, when I say sample, I mean like to converge, to get a converged free energy calculation. And T1 prime is the time, Ti prime is the time uh, uh, required to get a converged free energy in window I then you can demonstrate that T0 is always greater than the sum over I of Ti prime. So you want to, you want to stratify. You want to stratify. Uh, there are cases where you want to uh, uh, turn to an alternate uh, formulation of the adaptive biasing force. For instance, when you have, uh, when you have uh, restraints that are coupled to your uh, transition, say restraints, not constraints, Restraints coupled to your transition coordinate. Uh, that would be the case, for instance, when you're doing this protein ligand calculation, where you have, like, let's say that you separate the ligand from the protein, but you have uh, the conformation that is restrained, uh, the Euler angles that are restrained. So in this case, you want to turn to an extended Lagrangian formulation. Just in a nutshell, the idea is now you're no longer tracking down the transition coordinate, you're tracking down particle, a fictitious particle that is attached by means of a stiff spring to the transition coordinate. And then, then uh, well, no, uh, now it's on the fly, so you can, uh, you get immediately the result, the correct gradient, so that's it. Uh, yeah, so that's for the on the fly. Uh, I will have this slide, uh, it's not useful. Um, So now, safeguards. Uh, when you do this free energy calculation, I told you that you, uh, these ABF calculations, I told you that you want to, uh, uh, to stratify. So you, it means that you will generate for different windows, you will generate different gradient profiles. So uh, by virtue of the continuity of uh, uh, the, the, the gradient across the transition pathway, so the gradient is a continuous function of, of, uh, of xi, or of z in that case, uh, you want, uh, so you don't need, uh, unlike in umbrella sampling, which deals directly with the, uh, with the free energy, here we're dealing with the gradient. So you don't need to have any overlap between the windows because your force, your average force, is continuous across, across the reaction pathway. So you really want to have a continuous, uh, verify that, that your average force is continuous. And if this is the case, then you just paste the different pieces, integrate, take the negative of that, and there you go, you have the, profile, the fringy profile. Uh, fringy profiles, just like for in perturbation, in, in alchemical transformation, in perturbation theory, you want to provide them with an error bar. Uh, and while well, the mathematics exists, uh, I'm not going to lie to you, it's a real pain in the ass to calculate because you have to, to calculate this, uh, this correlation times. Because when you're doing MD, I mean, your data is highly correlated. so it's not like you're not dealing with n samples, but you're dealing with n samples divided by the correlation lengths of the series. So, but there are tricks to do that. I mean, it's not like you are completely abandoned uh, uh, in terra incognita. You know, it's a, a, there are tools to do it. Uh, but 
it has to be done. I mean, is there something that you want to, uh, when you provide your fringy profile, you also want to provide error blocks? Uh, one way to assess convergence uh, um, of your fringy calculation, it's a cheap trick, but uh, it's pretty informative. Instead of running a very long simulation, a very long fringy profile calculation, break it into subruns and, and just say that my last subrun is, con is the converged one. Just making this assumption. And then you calculate the RMSD on the gradient with respect to the previous subruns. And so if you have something that is like that decreases asymptotically, then you can say, I'm probably uh, like, like in this case, it's a you know, pretty good shape. If something that goes like this, mm, not so not so good. So probably uh, I need some more sampling. Okay. What about non-equilibrium work, computer experiments? Uh, can I have five more minutes? Is that okay? <laughs> Uh, so what about non-equilibrium uh, work experiments? So I mentioned that uh, at the beginning. Uh, so you can reconcile non-equilibrium work experiment with free energy by virtue of the uh, Jarzinski identity, which relates uh, the free energy to an ensemble of realization where you're pulling experiments. Uh, it convert. I mean, on the paper, it converges formally. In practice, you want to be in a near equilibrium regime. That's very important. Uh, and you need to run quite a bit of uh, independent simulations to get uh, a good estimate of this. Uh, just like the bar estimator, uh, you have the Crookes uh, theorem, uh, which uh, does pulling in both directions. And you can combine the two, uh, the two simulations to get a better estimate of your free energy, just like, just like a Bennett acceptance ratio. Uh, I'm going to pass on that. I'm going to go directly to uh, more interesting things. Uh, ongoing developments, I need to mention that. It's very important. So uh, you remember I was mentioning uh, some of these calculations are plagued by ergodicity problem. Like for instance, you are stuck in one confirmation. And, uh, and, and, but the problem is that uh, other confirmations are important for your free energy. So what you can do is the following. So you can take advantage of the massively parallel architectures that we have today and, and replicate your system. So imagine that you're interested in, uh, in the hydration free energy. Uh, you just propagate, uh, replicate your system. So at the different values of, uh, of lambda. So this is just a very simple example, but you, you can see at different values that make my solute disappear, right? And so uh, you propose some uh, swapping of, of, the, uh, of, of the configurations for two different adjacent values of, of lambda. And, and, and then you have your usual uh, metropolis Hastings criterion verify that it works. So you, are, you either accept the swap or you reject the swap. Is this acceptance criterion? And, um, and the idea is, you know, as you progress in the simulation is, Basically, have like make uh, uh, configurations uh, at uh, high value of lambdas accessible to configurations at low value of them, kind of uh, exchange uh, all across the uh, the reaction pathway. Now you can make even now you can even make that a little bit more complicated. So uh, in addition to uh, uh, propagating in lambda, you can also propagate in uh, in temperature. Well, what would you do? Want to do that? Uh, if you want to calculate entropies, for instance, using uh, what I was mentioning before, uh, the derivative of the, uh, of the free energy with respect to the temperature that gives you the, uh, the variation of, uh, of entropy. So, and again, here, uh, you can swap. So what we do uh, with this algorithm is we swap alternatively. So we swap in lambda, and we also swap in temperature. So one time we swap in lambda, one time we swap in, in temperature. And again, we, we, we accept with the same kind of uh, metropolis Hastings uh, uh, algorithm. Okay. <coughs> so all of this is available, by the way, in, uh, in NAMD. Uh, yeah, so I, um, yeah, I, could, I could also mention that. So uh, in the same line, this ergodicity problems. Uh, so imagine that. Uh, 
you, you want to progress. That's basically the problem that I already mentioned with the peptide nanotube. You, 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 your, your, your transition coordinate is psi. You want to progress along psi, but you have this orthogonal degree of freedom uh, that's, uh, that, that's kind of a problem. You have this uh, hidden barrier uh, along zeta. You're, you're working along, I mean, your ABF or your umbrella sampling is helping you alongside to go, to go up the hill. But remember this formula, you have this ensemble average at constant psi. And at constant psi, it means that you have to sample not only this valley for one value of psi, but you also have to sample that valley. And the problem is that uh, you have this high barrier. So what can you do for that? Well, one way to uh, solve the problem, so if you use what, just one, one walker, uh, you're basically uh, staying in one, one, one valley and you're stuck in that valley, right? Uh, so the idea is, uh, um, so it will never, I mean, crossing the barrier would be a super rare event. So what you really want to do is actually uh, propagate that, uh, that uh, replicate that walker. And so you, now you have multiple walkers living their happy life on the, on the free energy landscape and exchanging information uh, every now and again about the, the surface, about the gradient that they see, right? And, uh, and then you can even make it more complicated uh, using uh, introducing some Darwinian uh, selection rules. So we kill the bad ones and we promote the good ones. So the, the bad ones are the ones that don't diffuse very far and the good ones are those like the really uh, uh, covered uh, a, a good stretch of the uh, of the free energy landscape. Uh, I think I'm gonna. I want to stop here. Do I want to stop here? Pretty much, yes. I mean, uh, we can talk about it this afternoon. I, I had one extra slide about going beyond the thermodynamics. I mean, now we can also use these free energy calculations to do kinetics. So for this afternoon, this is what you have on the menu. Um, uh, I just want to say one word about that. Uh, you have like some very uh, basic uh, introductory material, one for uh, uh, geometric calculation with ABF, one for uh, alchemical calculation. I know I, you know, I, I, I was eavesdropping yesterday, and I know that some of you are interested in binding free energy. There is, there is one tutorial for binding to protein ligand binding free energy, but if you've never done any free energy calculation before, I would highly recommend that you don't go here because then you will really hate me. Uh, uh, just go there first. I mean, just do not, you don't need to do the whole thing, but just do one or two exercises in this one and in that one. Uh, this tutorial is protein ligand binding free energy uh, from the two point of view, the geometric route and the, uh, and the alchemical route. And finally, this one is a little bit more advanced. That's using the string method. So, uh, it has two parts. The first part is actually finding the transition pathway, and the second part is calculating the free energy along the transition pathway. Yes? If you know the, the reaction coordinate, but you know that you can represent it by two, uh, by two dimensions, is it more convenient? If you're only really interested in seeing calculating the barrier height, is it more convenient to do the uh, two dimensional from the dynamic study or something like a AVF or to do Yeah, it well, in this, case, in this case, you're going to compare actually the, 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 the real thing, because oh. David Chandler showed in uh, 2000 that uh, for dialanine, the, 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 the reaction pathway, at least in vacuum, the reaction pathway, oh, sorry, the reaction coordinate, the real reaction coordinate is five psi. And you're going to verify that uh, you can also use like transition path sampling, and that it gives the same the same answer, right? And the times it takes to simulate. Well, 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 the trans well, Avicii could tell you that during like a, 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 a swarm of trajectories. I mean, the uh, the string with swarm of trajectories is extremely expensive. So in this case, it's not really worth it. It's more like a proof of concept. But like for more complicated uh, uh, reaction uh, pathway or more complicated uh, free energy landscape, for instance, the example of uh, ATPase that was done, I didn't say that, but that was done in, uh, with 392 uh, Cartesian coordinates. So that's, that's a different story, that's a different, so imagine the size of the, the dimensionality of the, uh, of the space.
So in that case, yes, you have to do that. Yeah, you cannot do a ABF umbrella sampling because you are discretizing your transition coordinates. Uh, so you would have to fill these little boxes. So when it's one dimension, you feel like you know, like it's pretty easy, pretty fast. Two dimension, now you have like all these little squares. Then in 3D, you have all these little cubes. After 3D, it's you're pretty much toast. So then you really do you really need to do transition path sampling and then do a reduction projection into 1D with something like the string method or yep. So in replica exchange, yes. So how do you swap the two systems? How do I what? So what is the criteria to swap the system? To swap? Oh, it's completely random. So what we do is uh, we select in the process. So we have these different uh, these different boxes, these different replicas that are run uh, for different values of the, the Hamiltonian or different values of lambda, right? And so we just select randomly a pair of boxes with adjacent boxes and we propose a swap. And, and then, then with the Metropolis Hastings uh, criteria, we either accept the swap or we reject the swap. What is the criteria to accept the swap? Oh, it's just energy based on uh, uh, so the energy of the box with uh, so you have to it's a combination of uh, the, the 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 configuration of box i and the value of lambda i the coordinates of box i and the value of lambda j, uh, the coordinates of box j and lambda i, and the coordinates of lambda j, uh, the coordinates of j and lambda j. So that's a, uh, you have like a, a energy for this, uh, uh, the energy for this, uh, uh, for this uh, four combinations. You mean that if they are in the same state of energy, then they're going to have the same component? Pardon me? They are in the same state of energy, then they are going to see the same confirmation. Uh, confirmation. The three dimensions stage, orientation of something. They belong to same energy, that's what they're saying. No, they have different energies. Why would they have the same energy? Then we cannot solve the thing. They should be in, in level with the energy. Then the probability goes one. So Are you afraid of the acceptance? Yes. Yeah, well, that's why. No, that's why we choose a contiguous uh, boxes. And again, we, we, we This is the same problem as uh, what I was mentioning at the beginning. You know, you need your perturbation to be a perturbation, not a huge change in, uh, not a, like a substantial change in, uh, in, uh, uh, of your system, right? So that's why you need. Yeah, it's important. We. Uh, I insist that that the uh, it has to be adjacent boxes. It's not like uh, uh, lambda equals zero and lambda equals one. That's of course will your acceptance rate will rapidly tend towards zero. Sensor value. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, if you go with respect to temperature swapping, yeah, that's the temperature yep. So how do you scale the temperature with respect to your sample? How do I scale the temperature? Is there any factor which brings the number of temperature range with respect to the case of the problem? Suppose if I take theta. Yeah, so so um, the choice of the temperature is uh, the choice of the temperature increment is uh, is actually a problem. Uh, well, it's a problem. If it's too big, then uh, the uh, linear approximation for calculating delta s. Is no longer true. If it's too small, then your free energy change is on the order of the error of the calculation. So it's a, it's a, I can point you. I mean, we, we worked on that. I mean, we have a couple of papers on that. It's a, the choice is a, yeah, it's a delicate choice. Yeah, yeah, it's something that uh, you need to think about. So I, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't read somewhere through, so it depends upon the number of atom of the case, like if you select the protein, so take the number of atom, 
if there is some nearest prime number i forgot right now that uh, well, to tell you the truth, I mean, we haven't done protein yet. We, we, we're still at the level of very, very small solute. I mean, when it comes to calculate the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the entropy, uh, so we've done, uh, we've done very modest methane dimerization. We've done uh, uh, ethanol hydration. But still, even for these guys, it's uh, it's very delicate choice. I mean, you're, for the reason I was mentioning, like too large is not good, too small is not good either. And you have to find a, a regime of, of, of delta T that is uh, kind of acceptable. 